Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to this session on metadata. Well done for choosing metadata over collaboration with, <laughs> with university presses. Um, we're all of a kind, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, you may notice that we've changed the title slightly uh, because it was metadata for discoverability and research integrity specifically, but as we got the panel together and started talking, uh, whilst research integrity is a key uh, topic for many of us, there are so many more use cases and so many more things and challenges in our industry that metadata can help with. Uh, so, yeah, we are calling it discoverability and beyond. Um, so we will cover all of these cases one way or another. Uh, so um, we're going to attempt to have a slightly interactive session. So if everybody wanted to come forward, no, I'm just kidding, stay where you are. Um, we, we, we did think about having a circle with a small group of sort of a metadata therapy session. Um, but uh, we have prepared some content. We will introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about how we got into metadata, why, why we care. Um, and we've prepared a metadata life cycle, a sort of typical journey uh, through metadata, and each one of us will go through a few typical stages of that. And then for the last half of the session, we'd really like to have some discussion. So we have uh, a few key questions, and we really want questions from you, and we'll also be asking you some things as well. Um, but first, some introductions, and I will start with myself. And when we chose this template, we didn't quite realize how big the pictures would be. But there you go. I'm also down here. Do you have to look up there? Um, so I'm Ginny Hendricks. I work for Crossref. Um, I'm the director of community engagement, um, and that encompasses technical support, global outreach. Uh, and I'm also looking after the product development team at the moment, temporarily. Um, I've been there for nine years, and I didn't really know about metadata at all before I arrived at Crossref. Uh, so it was a bit of a rude awakening to realize that was our main thing. Um, we're a metadata registry, uh, we are a DOI registration agency, and uh, we started off with uh, reference linking between articles primarily, and have really grown to include a lot more relationships and assertions and different data sources, and certainly grown globally to 20,000 publishers are members of Crossref now from 160 countries. Uh, so we're a team of 47 people trying to manage this community, just to reference from this morning. Um, I was also one of the co-founders of the Metadata 2020 initiative, which concluded a couple of years ago. Um, and that brought together stakeholders from libraries, from publishers, from service providers, funders, and researchers as well to um, address and highlight some of the common challenges across the community with uh, metadata, and they had some useful output, so I'd direct you to that website, Metadata 2020. And I'm also involved in uh, RAW, was one of the sort of founding, um, I guess, volunteers <laughs> for the uh, Research Organizations Registry, and that is um, yeah, a persistent identifier for affiliations, uh, also soon to be for funders as well. And I'm involved with the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, that's that uh, orange pylon there, that's the logo. Uh, <laughs> definitely a volunteer group. So about 18 organizations uh, across um, uh, scholarly communications have signed up for these 16 principles uh, for open scholarly infrastructure. And it's all around sustainability in the sense of kind of financial support, uh, but also around insurance. So making sure we have open code, open policies and practices so the community can um, to use an engineering term, fork Crossref if they want to recreate something uh, in a different image later on. And yeah, so I've thought a lot about metadata over the last 10 years at Crossref uh, and with these other initiatives. Um, but in the last few weeks, talking with this group here from university presses and, um, and from service providers, I've realized that we all think about it in slightly different ways. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to hear the perspectives of, of different, uh, different people. But first, we will introduce everybody um, so, Kira, you're up first. Hi, everyone. I'm Kira Michelson. I'm digital manager at um, Edinburgh University Press. So, welcome to our city. Um, so, I look after metadata um, education and management internally, and then also kind of the metadata and content support to the EUP websites and external kind of data providers, aggregators, and discovery services. So. Um, I'm involved with our digital strategy groups, our open access um, working group, and our accessibility 
working group as well as the Even Up um, Accessibility Working Group as well. So um, that's a bit about me. Was there a question? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Uh, no. Well, so uh, what got you into yes. Mesh Data? What brought you to this role? Yeah. So I started. My background is more um, from the library side. I was really interested in cataloging and acquisitions from the library perspective, um, and then. Um, ended up getting into publishing in the sales side and really learning about what goes into um, y you know, a book from the publisher all the way over to the end user and what really matters to get that into the hands of, of our readers. Um, so I worked at, in sales at EUP and now I've kind of moved into this more kind of digital and metadata um, oriented role. So um, yeah, really excited to, to have this conversation with people and I'll hand over to Sylvia. Thank you. Um, I'm Sylvia Pegg. I'm the Metadata Specialist for Publishing at the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, I've been at the Royal Society of Chemistry for about 16 years now, so a little while. I've had various roles in journals and books, but this metadata role is relatively new. Um, it's something that I was interested in um, from my role at the time in books production. I was really keen to make sure that all the effort I was going to, to producing these books, they were actually getting into the hands of readers. And that sparked my interest in metadata and eventually me advocating for us to spend more time on metadata, which then turned into my current job. Um, so I sort of forced my own way into metadata there, um, but I'm glad I did. Uh, hello, my name is Magali Vascones. Uh, I'm currently um, the Discovery and Users Manager for Gale, that's part of Engage. Um, before, so my, my career started in the libraries, I working for specialized libraries where I was doing, at the beginning, cataloging. Um, and then I have worked for GISC as a manager of the Knowledge Base uh, Plus, it was a service that standard around 11 years. And then I started working for content providers and publishers. So why, when I started working in metadata, I didn't know that I was taking a very important turn in my career. So I became good slowly, slowly. I became knowledgeable about it. I understood the importance and such a crucial element of the publishing industry. So I work a lot, I volunteer a lot on groups like the NICE group for metadata, for knowledge base metadata, ebooks metadata, audiovisual metadata, etc. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jen Meller and I'm the operations manager at Manchester University Press. Um, uh, so my team is responsible for all our metadata that's feeding out and, and signing off all the metadata on MUP titles. Um, the reason I care about metadata is that, um, well, about a million years ago I worked for Blackwells, so um, cared about metadata from a retail perspective. When I started MUP I um, was in the production team and was initially responsible for journals, so I suddenly cared about journal metadata. And then um, a few years ago, we started an audio program, and I was involved in that, and so that was a whole new set of metadata. So it's quite exciting to see all the sort of different perspectives. And then, yeah, adding libraries and service providers here today, it's quite a nice, bringing it all together. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, so now we'd like to, you all to introduce yourselves, but we'll do that a little bit collectively, <laughs> otherwise we'll be here for the full hour on that. Um, so can I have a show of hands for those of you, um, we want to see what type of publishing or what part of the industry you're in. So uh, those of you who are in sort of editorial, pure publishing editorial side, raise your hands. Ooh, quite a few, yeah, about maybe a third or a quarter of the group. Um, how about sort of more the business side, so sales or marketing or management in general, another about the same chunk. Um, service providers or not really, sort of more servicing publishers. Okay, gosh, about a third, a third, a third. Did I miss anyone? Repositories, libraries, <laughs> libraries, <laughs> yeah. how could we forget? Um, okay, and then now um, let's get a sense of how uh, familiar um, everybody is with metadata. So I guess I'm looking for sort of um, uh, maybe a scale of one to three. So uh, one being heard about metadata, know I should know more, but definitely not an expert. Who's in that camp? Okay, not too many, excellent. Um, sort of two, somewhere in the middle, so familiar, um, you have a good handle on metadata, 
maybe don't work directly with it and wouldn't call yourself an expert. That's most of the question. Anyone? That's good. I was worried everyone was going to yeah. be three. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone brave enough to be three, level three, absolute metadata expert? Amazing. Easy. Put your hand you up. You should come, come up. <laughs> <laughs> come on up. <laughs> Join us. <laughs> Who has metadata in their job title? <laughs> Does anyone have metadata in the job title? No. Amazing. Surprisingly, at Crossref, we only have one person with metadata in their title, which is <laughs> astounding, really. <laughs> but we're obviously all involved, so probably on a two. Um, OK, thank you for that. I think that will help shape some of the questions and discussions as we, as we go uh, forward. Um, so I mentioned that we would talk about a metadata life cycle. And there's many ways you could sort of um, uh, talk about um, the role of metadata, um, but we've chosen to structure it in this quite traditional kind of linear way. Um, so uh, even though uh, this is a very traditional kind of publishing process from authorship, um, they don't necessarily realize they're creating metadata as they are sharing ideas, submitting uh, content, even... Um, you know, applying for grants and things like that. Metadata begins quite early. Um, and then when they're submitting uh, content to publishers, books, or journals, that's kind of what we would consider authorship. The production side of things is then next. Um, and that's really around um, quite a key role of the publisher, usually kind of production area uh, or operational department. So preparing, gathering, cleansing, perhaps outsourcing to different vendors, um, and making sure that the metadata tells the accurate story about that piece of work um, and preparing it for external distribution. Um, discovery, a big uh, part of the session and discussion today. Um, so really distributing that metadata throughout the whole ecosystem, so multiple uh, systems out there needing to be able to read that metadata, uh, which in turn uh, can make it more visible and make the content more visible. Um, and then that metadata doesn't stay still. It, it evolves, new standards come in, the records need updating, um, authors may change their names. All sorts of things happen uh, in the future beyond publication. So we are each going to take um, one of these in order, and I'm going to sit down for a few minutes. Okay. I'll go around this way. Jimmy. So um, I'm going to talk about the authorship stage. Um, this first stage in the metadata lifecycle, authorship is just the beginning. We want to be really clear that it's just the beginning of a, a dynamic process with a lot of collaborators. So so many different stakeholders and people feeding into what will eventually become what everybody sees in the world. Um, so it's a, a formative piece of the puzzle, and it involves usually the authors or contributors. Um, perhaps the editorial team in collaboration and marketing team from the publisher. And this is when the shape of the product, project and its metadata takes form. So it's far from a one and done process. It's not kind of filling out a form and then that's done. A piece of content's metadata fluidly takes shape during this period. Um, so the book, book or journal's metadata exists only between the originator and the publisher at this stage, typically. Um, so it allows a lot of opportunity for creative creativity and enhancement um, of that metadata. Once it reaches the next stage, or kind of checkpoint along the life si cycle and is, is sent out externally, it can become more difficult and potentially riskier to make major changes to the key metadata points. Um, and uh, I might note here as well that um, we have the advantage in academic publishing, especially for books, um, of longer production lead times, um, so we have more time to actually play and, um, you know, strategize with and manipulate metadata. So who's involved? Um, authors generally, as, as Jenny mentioned, will come into a project with an imagined or um, kind of ideal title or, or subtitle for them, um, and then it's kind of up to the, the editors and other team members to think strategically about how this can be optimized both for kind of clarity and um, and also for kind of sales and discovery potential. Um, so authors might have stylistic requirements or impulses. 
um, and then the editorial team and, and publisher will share feedback. Um, and often we'll be thinking kind of further ahead down the, down the kind of stages of the metadata lifecycle about how the type, title, subtitles, classification codes um, can be most representative of the work um, and research kind of contained inside. Um, meanwhile, the sales and marketing team might be thinking more about um, how the metadata can be best optimized for the web, um, it, you know, potentially increasing sales and discovery that way. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but about how different actors will think about metadata differently and be using it differently, so metadata as SEO. Um, and then finally, um, thinking about how um, discoverability and the interoperability of metadata using this, the standards that we have is beneficial both for the author and that their book is easily discovered, used, and cited, and for the publisher, increased visibility, sales, and usage. Um, and then looking at the, the basics, kind of what's included at this stage in the metadata, um, looking at title and subtitle. Um, so in academic publishing, we have the unique responsibility to clearly convey the research presented within the book, um, chapter or journal article and the title, but also the opportunity to make this piece of content stand out um, from amongst its competitors. Um, another key piece of metadata at this stage is abstracts and keywords, um, which may be more specific for shorter content items, so thinking about abstracts and keywords for chapters and articles versus books. Um, short and long descriptions, so these are descriptive elements um, that change hands as well as the, as the project progresses. They might stem from the author's original description, but are often reworked as the project takes shape. Um, classification codes and taxonomies like BISAC and FEMA, which we'll get into. Um, and then other identifiers, persistent identifiers such as the ISBN or person identifiers. Um, the more consistent these are, the more discoverable the content will be and the more interoperable these books and journal metadata will be with other discovery systems. So looking at current challenges or the current view um, at this stage really is about changing goalposts. Um, so thinking about meta metadata standards and also um, accessibility requirements, um, which will have knock-on effects in subsequent stages of the metadata lifecycle, but which begin often during this stage. Um, so one of the key challenges with with these is that they require buy-in from multiple players um, to keep up with and amend over time. Um, a recent example of this, and if there is anyone from editor in the room, I'm sure they'll remind me that FEMA is not new, but a recent um, kind of uh, requirement um, is that planned obsolescence of, of BIC um, to FEMA, um, early, which happened earlier this year in February. Um, and so as more and more retailers and discovery services um, deprecate BIC, publishers will have the responsibility to implement rich FEMA metadata for all of their backlists, including um, in addition to their front list, um, and thinking about how this might affect discoverability long term for all of our titles. Um, we'll have a slide for resources at the end of the presentation, but um, the editor website provides detailed information about classification codes and how to apply them consistently. Um, and then the other, the other thing to kind of consider at this stage is how thinking about how a project will meet European Accessibility Act guidelines um, and requirements. Um, so for example, if a book is richly illustrated, who's responsible for creating the alt text at this stage for those images? Um, and if authors are contributing to this work, um, do, does the publisher have guidelines for that? Um, there are a few good presentations at last year's Alps conference um, kind of showcasing programs for automating alt text creation um, and integrated accessibility enhancements to content. Um, and it looks like there might be some real opportunity to use AI for this, um, but also some, some risks or drawbacks. So I'd be interested in hearing from the audience a little later if anyone's started using these um, and how that's going. Um, so those are the kind of main the main challenges at this stage. And I'll pass on next to Sylvia to talk us through the production stage. Hi, 
as a book or journal article comes into production, it's time to update and release the metadata to retailers, libraries, data aggregators, and distributors. The metadata should be updated and checked to make sure that it's still a good reflection of the product or the content that it describes and complete enough to release, including a final cover image in the case of books. As Kira has already talked about, this is still very much a collaborative effort with multiple roles involved. Who does what is going to vary from publisher to publisher, so some of the examples I give here might not match your processes exactly, but hopefully someone in your organisation is responsible for these metadata elements if they're applicable to your publications. The production team will update and add technical details, such as the spine width, page extents and weight, capturing the final specification. The editorial team may update metadata entered in, into systems in earlier in the process, for example, reviewing the prices, updating subject classification codes, or amending the chapter order. If any of the content is to be published open access, appropriate licensing and access metadata need to be included so that users of the content are clear about what they can and, and can't do with it. Metadata that's not yet captured upstream can be added or enhanced. For example, vendors already involved in production processes can verify that persistent identifiers, or PIDs, are present and correct in funding metadata. Current concerns that may need tracking or awareness during the production process can include if AI has been used, that needs to be clear, and where publisher policies allow that, of course. More and more metadata elements are being requested by supply chain partners for example, new requirements being introduced to provide commodity codes, spine width, carton quantities, gratis copy value, and country of manufacture. There may be differences in metadata depending on the methods of production. For example, country of manufacture will be supplied differently when traditional print methods, where the whole print run is carried out at a location, or where the title is manufactured print on demand, and the location of printing is determined by the delivery address. In an XML-first workflow, metadata can be captured with content files to aid with discovery. This usually requires multiple systems, both internal and external. These systems need to be able to work together to ensure that only up-to-date metadata is used. Metadata will change throughout the production process, whether it's the publication of an accepted manuscript through to the final version of record, or pre-order information changing to the published version, <coughs> updates need to feed out regularly. This ensures that metadata is timely, accurate, and the content it describes is discoverable. So I'll hand on to Magali to talk about discovery. Thank you. Okay, so when I put that list together, I didn't realize how challenging it will be to fit all that in five minutes. But I will do my best in a nutshell to walk you through all these items. So let's follow up this metadata life cycle. Now our content is live, I created and is available. And now we want metadata to help end users to find it and access it. This is what discovery is about. It refers to the actions related to searching, retrieving and accessing relevant content that we don't know about it. Of course, the opposite will be the research, retrieve, and access the content that we know about it. In terms of the metadata, the latter requires just essential basic metadata fields. We're talking about publication title, author, year. While for discovery, it will require an addition, index metadata, and enrich metadata. 